Hi everyone, this lesson is on vitamin C and its role in immune system functioning. Before we get into the role of vitamin C in the immune system, let's talk about what vitamin C is. Vitamin C is also known as ascorbic acid. It is an essential water-soluble vitamin that is a potent antioxidant, and this is going to be very important when we talk about some of the effects in the immune system later on in this lesson. Humans don't have the ability to synthesize vitamin C, so they have to get it from their diet. And some dietary sources of vitamin C include citrus fruits like oranges and lemons, tomatoes, strawberries, guava, bell peppers, potatoes, and broccoli. And the reason we need vitamin C is because it has important functions in the body. For one, it is involved in collagen synthesis. So it is involved in collagen hydroxylation. So it's involved in the reduction of ferric to ferrous ion. And it's also involved in stabilization of collagen. It's also involved in catecholamine synthesis as it is a cofactor with the enzyme dopamine beta hydroxylase. Dopamine beta hydroxylase is the enzyme that converts dopamine to norepinephrine. So it's involved in catecholamine synthesis. It's also involved in carnitine biosynthesis. Carnitine is involved in transporting long chain fatty acids into the mitochondria for metabolism to generate energy from those fatty acids. So it's involved in carnitine biosynthesis as well. And as is the topic of this lesson, vitamin C has important immune system effects, which are going to be important for proper immunological functioning. And we're going to talk about those important effects later on in this lesson. Before we get into how vitamin C acts on the immune system, let's talk about what happens when there is a vitamin C deficiency. So what we're going to talk about in this slide comes from this article entitled Vitamin C and Infections. So as I mentioned before, humans have to regularly consume food that contains vitamin C. The reason that they have to regularly consume foods with vitamin C is because humans have a low storage capacity for vitamin C. So when someone has eaten something that contains vitamin C, it enters into their small intestine where it is absorbed. The leftover vitamin C can often be excreted in the stool or if there's a high amount in the blood, it can be excreted in the urine. So when vitamin C has been absorbed and enters into the blood of the patient, it often will go up to a certain level, which is around 70 micromoles per liter. This is the saturated level in healthy patients. If there is too little vitamin C, and the definition here is often around less than 11 micromoles per liter, this would be considered deficiency. This would be considered where after or below this point, patients can often have an official vitamin C deficiency or scurvy, which is caused by vitamin C deficiency. However, having said that, even if a patient has more than 11 micromoles per liter, but they're on the lower end of this spectrum, they can have what is considered a subclinical deficiency, which is going to be important because they may not have all the symptoms of a true vitamin C deficiency, but they can have other effects on the immune system, which we will talk about as we go through this lesson. And certain patient populations are at a higher risk for having vitamin C deficiency or subclinical deficiency, including patients that have poor dietary intake of vitamin C. But not only those, we can also see these types of deficiencies in patients who are smokers or who are exposed to a lot of pollution. So smoking and pollution seem to reduce vitamin C levels. And we can also see an issue with low levels of vitamin C in elderly patients, for instance. So elderly patients are at a higher risk for having a vitamin C deficiency as well. So what happens when a patient actually has a vitamin C deficiency? So when they actually begin to have very low levels of vitamin C, the symptoms can begin within three months of decreased vitamin C intake. And vitamin C deficiency causes the condition known as scurvy. And scurvy has a variety of signs and symptoms, including what is known as scorbutic gingivitis. So this reddening and swelling around the gums between the teeth. There can also be issues with dental caries. There can be issues with easy bruising. And there can be issues with fatigue as well. But what's also important about scurvy is that it is associated with increased risk of infections. This is how we're going to tie this in with vitamin C and its importance in the immune system. So scurvy is associated with increased risk of infections, particularly respiratory illnesses such as pneumonia, which we're going to get into more detail as we go through this lesson. So now we're going to look at the importance of vitamin C in immune system functioning, and we're going to go through particular parts of the immune system and how vitamin C is important in those particular components of the immune system. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to come from this article entitled Vitamin C in Immune Function. So vitamin C is involved in modulation and function of the innate and adaptive immune system. So these are the two major branches of the immune system. And we're going to go into more specific detail as we go through the immune system. The first part of the immune system we're going to look at is the skin or the epithelial barrier. 
So vitamin C is found in keratinocytes in the epidermis. So keratinocytes are those skin cells in the epidermis. And as mentioned before, vitamin C is involved in collagen synthesis, but it is also involved in keratinocyte differentiation and also helps protect against damage from reactive oxygen species. So it's very important in maintaining that epithelial barrier, which is an important part of the innate immune system. Now, the problem here is that if there is a deficiency, or in some cases, even a subclinical deficiency of vitamin C, this can cause impaired wound healing. We see this in scurvy, for instance. And it has been found that in patients who have a vitamin C deficiency, increasing vitamin C in those patients can reduce healing time. And another important component here is that vitamin C may help modulate the inflammatory response during wound healing via improved macrophage mediated clearing of neutrophils. So when there is a wound, neutrophils will go into that area and scavenge that area. But at some point, those neutrophils will undergo a cell death. The problem is that vitamin C is important in the functioning of macrophages that actually go in and actually clean up those neutrophils. So if there is low or very low levels of vitamin C, this process can be suppressed, leading to neutrophils not being cleaned up properly in that area, leading to an aberrant inflammatory response in that area, suppressing or reducing the effectiveness of wound healing. So that's how vitamin C is important in wound healing and playing a role in maintaining the epithelial barrier, that barrier against pathogens. And now let's talk about how vitamin C plays an important role in immune cell functioning. We talked a little bit about this in the last slide, but we're going to get into more detail here. So vitamin C is present in high concentrations in immune cells, particularly neutrophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. So those are going to be the cells that contain very high levels of vitamin C. These cells often have a gradient of vitamin C that is roughly 50 to 100 fold higher than the surrounding serum. And what's important to note here is that during infections, vitamin C levels decrease. So vitamin C levels are likely very important in the functioning of these particular immune cells. And the vitamin C that these immune cells carry likely gets consumed in their process in fighting certain pathogens. And more specifically, vitamin C is involved in the following functions. It is involved in improving the movement of white blood cells, so chemotaxis. Chemotaxis is the process where immune cells like neutrophils will sense other immune system chemicals like interleukins, follow those chemicals back to the source of infection. So it helps white blood cells get to where they need to be. Vitamin C is also important in neutrophil phagocytosis. So phagocytosis is the process where a neutrophil will engulf and ingest and destroy a pathogen like a bacteria. Vitamin C is also involved in B and T cell lymphocyte maturation, proliferation, and function. And it's also involved in increasing or improving the production of antibodies as well. So these are some very important tools that immune cells employ to help fight bacteria and other pathogens. And then vitamin C also seems to have a role in modulating or lowering histamine levels as well. So I also want to mention that here. Now, one part of why vitamin C is very important is because it likely counteracts reactive oxygen species produced by immune cells. So immune cells like neutrophils use a host of reactive oxygen species to help destroy bacteria and other pathogens. So reactive oxygen species are compounds or molecules that have an unpaired electron and these can often cause damage to cell membranes. So this is why some of these neutrophils and other immune cells use reactive oxygen species to help them destroy certain pathogens. And as I mentioned earlier, vitamin C is a potent antioxidant and antioxidants help neutralize reactive oxygen species by donating electrons to them. So that's why we say that vitamin C likely counteracts reactive oxygen species produced by immune cells. So vitamin C helps modulate the immune response by neutralizing these reactive oxygen species. So in the case where there is too little or lower levels of vitamin C, having low levels of vitamin C can lead to an imbalance of reactive oxygen species leading to activation or upregulation of NF-kappa B signaling. But if we were to actually increase vitamin C, when looking at those downstream signaling pathways, having more vitamin C around suppresses oxidant generation and NF-kappa B signaling. So this is why we can see vitamin C playing a very important role in modulating the immune system and preventing aberrant inflammatory responses. Let's talk about some infections that may be helped or reduced by vitamin C supplementation. So some studies have shown vitamin C may have some antibacterial, antiprotozoal, and antifungal properties. 
But having said that, a lot of these studies are from animal models. So it may not be applicable to humans, but it's interesting to look at some of this evidence here. So some of the evidence that has been shown in animal models includes reductions in the severity of tuberculosis and other bacterial species. From these studies, vitamin C has also been shown that it may have some important roles in suppressing or reducing toxins from diphtheria and tetanus bacteria. It may also have some beneficial roles against certain protozoal species, and it may have some roles against candida albicans, which is a fungus that can cause candidiasis in humans. So again, these findings are from animal models, so they may not be applicable to humans, but it's interesting to make note of these findings either way. And now let's talk about how vitamin C may help with viral infections. So a lot of these are going to come from this article entitled The Antiviral Properties of Vitamin C. So it has been found in humans that vitamin C deficiency can increase the risk and severity of respiratory infections. We mentioned earlier that scurvy increases risk of infections like pneumonia. And vitamin C deficiency has been found to be associated with increased severity and incidence of the common cold. So these are some very interesting and important findings in humans. More data showing some of the roles of vitamin C against viral infections comes from some animal studies with looking at the effects of influenza virus. So one study found that the influenza virus H3N2 is more lethal in mutant mice with a vitamin C deficiency. And in these mice, there were increased pro-inflammatory cytokines. So again, vitamin C is important in modulating the immune response. And vitamin C may have antiviral properties against other types of viruses. But again, the caveat here is that a lot of this evidence comes from animal studies. So vitamin C may have important roles in fighting off particular viral infections, including Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes virus, polioviruses, rabies virus. So again, these are from animal models, so it's hard to apply these to humans. But nevertheless, there has been some evidence to show that particularly if there is a vitamin C deficiency, if there's low vitamin C levels, these types of viruses and other infections are often more severe. And some in vitro studies have also demonstrated that vitamin C has antiviral effects in the presence of the following, free copper and or iron and low pH. So that can also be something to make note of here as well. So again, a lot of this evidence comes from animal models and in vitro studies. Now let's talk about vitamin C as a treatment in humans. So there has been some studies showing beneficial effects of vitamin C as a treatment in humans. So the following day that we're going to look at in the next two slides comes from the articles entitled Vitamin C in Infections, Vitamin C for Preventing and Treating the Common Cold, and the Effectiveness of Vitamin C in Preventing and Relieving the Symptoms of Virus-Induced Respiratory Infections. So one meta-analysis demonstrated that a daily dose of at least 200 milligrams of vitamin C helped reduce the following. One, the incidence of common cold. So looking at how frequently a patient gets the common cold, if they are on a daily dose or daily supplementation of vitamin C, they're less likely to get the common cold. Two, this daily dose of vitamin C helped reduce symptoms of the common cold. So when a patient had a common cold, the symptoms of the common cold were often more mild. And three, vitamin C supplementation helped reduce the duration of the common cold. So it helped reduce the number of days a patient had the common cold. And this was especially important in deficient patients. So patients who had very low levels of vitamin C often had a longer duration of the common cold. And as I mentioned before, vitamin C levels are decreased during infection. And in particular, they are decreased during sickness with the common cold. So it's likely that immune cells are utilizing the vitamin C. So replenishing vitamin C during this period when a patient is sick is probably going to be very helpful for those patients. Other studies have demonstrated that higher doses of vitamin C reduce symptoms of the common cold in influenza. So these higher doses are often used when the patient is asymptomatic, so when they're not having any symptoms, at symptom onset and throughout the infection. So it can be utilized at many different points. So when a patient is symptomatic, when they have symptoms of the common cold or influenza, doses of 1,000 milligrams every six hours, repeating for up to three days, seem to be beneficial. And then when they were asymptomatic, these higher doses or mega doses were 1,000 milligrams three times per day. And what was found was that these higher doses of vitamin C reduced symptoms and length of infection. So that was important to make note of as well. However, the benefits may only be for viral infections as streptococcal infections were not significantly improved. And in another study, it was found that in hospitalized elderly patients with pneumonia, vitamin C supplementation was 
found to reduce the following. As mentioned before, oftentimes elderly patients will have lower levels of vitamin C or they're at a higher risk of having lower levels of vitamin C and hospitalized elderly patients are even at a higher risk of having lower vitamin C levels. So vitamin C supplementation was found to reduce the following. The vitamin C supplementation dose was 250 to 1600 milligrams per day. And in these patients, respiratory symptom score was lowered in severe patients or the more severe patients. And vitamin C supplementation reduced the length of hospitalization in those patients. And this occurred in a dose-dependent manner. So the higher the dose of vitamin C given, the lower the length of hospital stay. Prophylactic supplementation of vitamin C also appears to be beneficial as well. And a lot of these benefits have to do with whether or not a patient is deficient or has subclinical deficiency. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.